Yep. Typically, the governor and the state won't change the budget uh, once it's been approved. However, there has been times where they have changed the budget. I think the, the aspect of the economic uncertainty that President Oakley is referring to uh, lies within the deficit factor that the state imposes on the community colleges. Um, again, a quick reminder of the deficit factor. Our funding is based upon the number of FTES that we generate. And there's three, basically three sources. Now there's four sources of funding that we get to help come up to that total state principal apportionment. So I mentioned earlier that we've budgeted $100,358,000. There are four components to get to that. It's the local enrollment fees that we collect, so 98% of those. It's the property taxes that um, the county collects for us and remits to us. It's the education protection account funding that comes from the state. And then there's the state general apportionment. And so what the deficit factor is, is if at any one period of time when either the enrollment fees, the property taxes, or now the education protection account funds don't come in at the level that they have put into the state budget, they don't make up the difference with the state general apportionment. What they do is they apply a deficit factor. So we've built a 1% deficit factor into our budget, but that rate has fluctuated drastically in the last two years. In 13-14 alone, it went from 6.75% in March, down to 3.7% in June, and then when they did our recalculation for the 13-14 year, it was at 0.19%. For this current fiscal year in 14-15, the state has already imposed over a half percent deficit factor on our advanced apportionment. We've built in a 1%. The light, there's I would say a strong likelihood that at both P1 and P2, it could be higher than 1%. And so if it is higher than 1%, this economic uncertainty's lines would come into play. Would it be possible to get a breakdown of the uh, 6.630 million um, on how that was calculated? It's like just the one for the deficit factor, those things be beyond the, the fact that it's the remainder, or like the assumptions that we take into play for economic uncertainty. There, there's not a breakdown. The the breakdown is we take the 17.8 million dollars, we back out the 6.1 billion dollars for the board mandated reserve, we back out the 1.8 million dollars for the potential enrollment shortfall. You would back out the 576,000 on the reserve for the new faculty, and then we had back out the 2.6 for the vacation and load banking, and then the balance is going to be that 6.6 .6 million dollars that you see there on economic uncertainties. So there's not a breakdown of exactly what goes in there. It's just the balance of what has not been assigned or part of the five and a half percent board mandated reserve. I just very quickly, because I want to move this along, we're going to get into histories and things of that nature, but the, the question that came up, which is a good question, as far as with the budget, the next budget that really they begin the process does not really begin until January, President Oakley? The I governor have... proposes a um, proposed state budget uh, in January, as well as any revisions to the current budget in January. Okay, so that will be the next time. And up until that, the answer to the question, Trustee Z, is it's, it's done. That will be when they start bringing it back in from Sacramento to review it. So anyway, I'm no, I, I, get, I get that. I just when you're deducting, you're you know you're pretty much deducting out of the 17.8, the remainder of the 17.842, correct? Correct. So you already know that you're going to be at a 17.8 million. That's what the the budget that we're bringing forward is that our ending fund balance will be at 17.8 million dollars if we s receive all the revenue that we've put into the budget and if we spend every single dollar that we've put into the budget. Thank you. Okay. You know what? So here is a seven-year um, summary. 
that uh, shows some of the trends on the first line is the salaries and benefits as a percentage of total expenses. So you can see there that that has fluctuated uh, pretty uh, significantly over the last few years. In 0809, it was 86.7%. Um, um, in both 11, 12, and 12, 13, it got up to a high of 89%. Last year in 13, 14, it dipped down to 85%. And then now what we've presented in this budget, um, it would be back up to 87.5%. And can you just, because this is an area where it's one of those that, that I've looked at as a trustee, there are certain districts and particularly rural areas that get down to the 79 percentile, but that's really, mm -hmm. it's really not an appropriate way to compare. I'll use City College of San Francisco, they've gotten into the dangerous 92, 93 uh, percent. But we've been doing a lot of, I, I know there's a, a reason for this, but if you could explain it. We've done a lot of things, and yet it still has gone up from 13, 14, to 1415. So you just want to elaborate why it went from 85 to 87.5 with all the things we've done? Well, it's primarily related to we hired the 42 full-time faculty. We increased the, the classified uh, positions. Our benefits went up. Um, so even though, um, you know, we, we've increased, as I mentioned, we increased our salaries and benefits by almost $10 million, and we only decreased everything else by one and a half million. So we had almost an eight and a half million dollars increase in expenditures um, between the two different years. And, and this number that we are at, 80, 85, or 87.5, seems to be the, the best practices, parameters for colleges similar to us. So it's not anything to be alarmed about, unlike if it was the City College of San Francisco where they suddenly get into the low 90s, then they do have start a problem. So I just, right. I see it and I know I've used this in the past and there's been different ways of, it's one way to calculate and we're fine. I was just wanted to have you explain it. So thank you. If I can complicate that explanation, um, we're fine, but we're not fine. Uh, it is a high number. Um, it's something that we have to accept uh, if we are going to continue to operate two comprehensive campuses. Um, and that's a choice that we make. Um, uh, we have duplicate staff at both campuses that provide services to our students. That's not something that is normally done in a single college district. Um, and so it is a number we have to watch. It is higher than it normally is for a single college district, but there's a reason for it, and it's a choice that we've made. Is this a number that triggers uh, certain regulatory agencies? Is this one of those, those figures they look at extremely close? It, um, at this point, there's not a magic number that triggers the chancellor's office, but it does impact our, um, our rating agency, um, uh, our, um, for bonds, borrowing costs, uh, because, uh, rating agencies will look at our ability to manage, um, uh, ongoing fixed costs and this this number we typically have to explain why it's as high as it is thank you uh, perhaps we can uh, draw down our other expenses that may be a help in this number yeah. actually if you draw down the other expenses then that percentage will go higher so are you telling me we should increase our expenses no I just <laughs> I was just commenting. Just, at, just wondering what would happen that, if we drew down the other expenditures. This percentage would go higher. Well, we need to increase our revenue then. Hopefully, the state will do that for us. Yeah. So welcome, welcome the, the, the next line county. that we have on here is just uh, the surplus or deficit. So um, remember, this is representing six years of actual and then one year of adopted budget. So over the six years of actual, three of those years uh, resulted in a deficit, three of the years resulted in a surplus, um, but as I mentioned, we are proposing a deficit uh, budget in the 14-15 year. Um, there's the history of the ending balances and then the percentage of the ending balances um, as a percentage of the total expenses. So the next two slides is just to give the board a little bit of history of where we've been with the cuts. 
So, um, so in 9-10 was when the state started cutting our revenue. And so what we've provided here is each fiscal year, how much revenue was either lost or um, was earned based upon the state budget. So if we go down and just focus there on the bottom, the six year total, the total increase or decrease, we have lost $6.9 million in funding um, due to the state actions or about 6.7%. Now comparing that to the changes in our expenditures, here's the slide for the expenditures. You see there at the six year total, we've only decreased our expenditures by $1.4 million. So we've lost $6.9 million in revenue. Our expenditures have only gone down by $1.4 million overall um, from where they were. And then you see we have an amount of cuts there. That was the amount of uh, cuts that were made in each fiscal year, budget year to budget year. So had we not made those difficult decisions and difficult cuts, I think we would be in a lot worse off than where we are today. Moving on to this slide, this is um, a projection of if we don't change anything uh, and we just roll over our budget, um, what things might look like moving into 1516. So that center column, that's the adopted budget for 1415. You see there down at the bottom, the ending fund balance is the $17.8 million. If we assume um, that we're gonna receive all the revenue that we put into the budget, that we're gonna spend everything that's in the budget, then our starting point on July 1st of 15 will be the $17.8 million. We do a rollover budget, which means that whatever we budgeted in 1415, will be budgeted in 1516 as our starting point. So since we budgeted a deficit of $3.3 million, we're showing that deficit again in that on the second line under the projected 1516 column. The apportionment changes that um, we've put here, this is assuming that we would receive COLA at a 2.1%. That's what school services is estimating that the statutory COLA would be in 1516. That doesn't mean that the governor is going to fund it, but we just put that number in there um, to show if we were to receive it. Again, um, the other changes that we've made on here, the new and restored positions, that's the 576,000. That's for the six new faculty. That's the minimum number that we would need to hire. Salary rate increases. Uh, this includes the 1.05% COLA that has been approved um, for CHI and the managers and what has been offered uh, to classified and CCA. And then the other salary and benefit changes is really our step and column increases as well as our um, health and welfare increases, PERS increases and STRS increases, what we're estimating those would be. And then what we're adding back in are the one-time expenditures that we've made in 14-15 um, for like the instructional equipment funding, the uh, technology refresh funding, those types of things. So those are the known changes that we would need to make to the 15-16 budget if we were developing it right now, uh, which would mean that we would have a deficit of $3.8 million which would bring our ending fund balance down to just under $14 million. So that's really what this is trying to show is if we continue down the path of where we are today and only made those known changes that we know about right now, uh, we will continue deficit spending and will be eroding into that economic uncertainties line item. Okay, so, um, so that we don't end up in that situation, what is our plan to increase revenue? I see a zero, I don't, I'm not happy with that. It was in here. It's, it's not pretty looking. You know, more than 90% of our revenue budget comes from apportionment. So it is very difficult to increase revenue appreciably um, 
to make a huge difference. You know, some of the things that we are doing is we are really focusing on trying to get more grants. Um, when those grants allow it, we do charge an indirect cost rate, and that helps defray the costs and provide funding to the unrestricted general fund. Um, those so are the grants allow for, because uh, most of the grants I've seen in the budget has been in the restricted general fund. Are you saying that there's a, uh, that, that can be um, allocated under the unrestricted? For some means? of the grants, they allow either, we call it an indirect cost rate to be charged or an administrative cost allowance that can be charged. And when that's allowed, we do charge that back. And so you will see those indirect costs um, not so much on the revenue side, but on, you can see it on page 20 of the adopted budget book, the last, next to the last line there that says indirect costs. So in the adopted budget, we've built in that we're going to receive $1,079,000 in indirect costs, and that's coming from the grants uh, that we serve within the restricted general fund. And but so but to, be, to be clear on her question, you cannot put those grants in the unrestricted general fund. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, this indirect cost, though, it shows as a deficit in, at, at, upon page 20, not as this. Uh, right, uh, that's because the budget and accounting manual, um, since on, on our CCFS 311 report, which is the next board item, we show the unrestricted general fund and the restricted general fund to come to a total general fund amount that goes to the state. So since those indirect costs are shown as an expenditure in the services in the restricted general fund, then we show it as an abatement of an expenditure in the unrestricted general fund. So when you total the general fund between the unrestricted and the restricted, that comes to zero. I got you, but what's our plan to in increase it? Is it mainly just, in uh, is it s predominantly increasing enrollment and getting apportionment? Our, as uh, Vice President Gable stated, the unrestricted general fund is primarily funded by FTES. Um, we have attempted to work with the legislature to allow us to find other ways to generate income. Um, that has not come to fruition. Um, so uh, we continue to fund operations outside of the general fund through grants, and um, that's why you see our categorical funds growing, because at this point in time, the governor and the legislature are increasing our budgets in categorical funding, which are for specific outcomes. Um, so although our, our overall budget is increasing, our unrestricted general fund continues to be relatively flat because there are no other sources that the governor or legislature is putting in to the unrestricted general fund. Uh, the governor could choose to fund us higher in COLA. Governor could choose to, to add those funds to the unrestricted general fund, but at this point in time, uh, we're being asked to deliver specific outcomes uh, in the categorical areas. But so, we, we can't uh, focus on increasing enrollment, however. That's always our, our choice. I mean, that, that should be our commitment. I'm, I'm assuming it is. To continue uh, to of, increase. Course <laughs> yeah. of course it is. Uh, but we're not going to increase enrollment for the sake of increasing enrollment. We're going to increase enrollment where students actually have need. Uh, and where the taxpayer dollar actually goes to work. So um, we could certainly find, um, you know, any class that you can think of and throw it on the, the class schedule, but that doesn't serve the students' needs. Right, I'm talking about FTES. Well, so am I. Uh, okay. um, so, so yes, um, we're going to continue to focus on student needs, and we're going to continue to do everything we can uh, to grow enrollments, uh, but at the same time, have, it, have to recognize that in, within the district, the K-12 uh, enrollments are declining. Uh, so that directly impacts our enrollment. Um, so then we're, we're forced to look outside of the district for additional enrollments, which we are doing. Uh, and we're creating a plan now to continue to 
market the quality education that we deliver to students outside the district, but that's where the additional enrollment would have to come from. Right, so what you're referring to is the funded FTES, increasing that amount that is shown on um, slide 14 that Anne-Marie uh, was right. speaking well, to. Yes. That's what I'm talking about, and I I'm glad you mentioned this because that was a question for me. It's a source of uh, revenue for us, and we do, we, I, I certainly don't want to be co uh, at the mercy of the state and these uh, fluctuations, and um, if there's something that we're in control of, and it sounds like this is the well, we are thing. Okay, um, and let me take a step back. Uh, Vice President Gable has already included all the revenue that we could possibly get from the state of California through apportionment. Uh, we don't believe that we're going to make that target, but that number is shown in, in the budget document, what that ultimate um, funded enrollment would be. The state will not fund us beyond that enrollment. We are in control only in so far that we, are, we try to get to the target. The state may not fund that enrollment. The state may not fund that enrollment at 100%. It may fund it at 90%. It may fund it at 80%. We won't know that until next year after the enrollment has been uh, wow. uh, done. Because if every college district in the state grows to that ultimate enrollment number, the state does not have enough funding to meet that enrollment. I really appreciate you um, explaining that. It was a mystery to me, and thank you. It's a mystery to us all how the yeah. state budgets. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the world of higher education in the state of California and funding. Have I passed my initiation? <laughs> just, uh, it, it doesn't get any better, though, so don't feel bad. Okay, so just quickly moving into some of our, our future budget challenges. I've already mentioned the full-time faculty obligation number, um, so I won't cover that again. Proposition 30 revenues, this is the education protection account funding. Um, you know, we need to keep in mind that these are temporary tax increases. So the sales tax terminates at the end of 2016. The income tax increase terminates at the end of 2018. So I think every uh, community college and K-12 district in the state is hoping that by the time we get to the end of 2016, the state economy has uh, rebounded sufficiently to where this will not result in cuts to our funding again, but there is that huge uncertainty that it could very well result in cuts to our funding when we get to um, the termination of those increased taxes. So that's just something that I like to continue to remind the board of uh, down the road, uh, we may have further challenges. And the continuation of Prop 30, though, is a vote of the people, not of the legislature? Correct. So it's not something that the legislature can just do on their own. They're going to have to go back to the voters if they're going to maintain the same level of funding. Correct. Okay. Um, the other item... Although the legislature could always vote to increase taxes. This is true. <laughs> if it's for education, I'll vote for it. It's true. All right. Um, the other item is um, our discretionary funding... Um, as uh, Trustee Zia was referring, we need additional discretionary funding. Uh, President Oakley, I think, very well described that uh, most of the funding that has been coming through our budgets recently is tied up into categorical programs, and there isn't a whole lot of unrestricted or what we call discretionary revenue coming. So that is going to be a concern moving forward if that trend continues. Again, as I explained, the deficit factor fluctuates um, each reporting period, so we don't know what's going to happen with that. And then the big one uh, is the state pension obligations. And so the employer contributions are scheduled to increase for both STRS and PERS uh, substantially over the next seven years. So here's a slide that shows how much it will increase each year from the previous year. So starting with 1314, uh, the rates were 8.25% for STRS and they were at 11.44% for PERS. In 1415, I mentioned that they increased. So the dollar amount of the increase uh, was 295,000 for STRS. For PERS, it was 78,000. Moving into the 1516 year, um, the rate goes up substantially for both of those. So our incremental cost increase on STRS 
is $865,000 in 15-16 and $197,000 uh, for PERS. Over the seven-year period, and again, these dollar amounts are based upon the salaries that we budgeted in 14-15. So over a seven-year period, if our salary amounts were to stay the same, we're looking at a $5 million increase in STRS alone and another $2 million increase in PERS. So these are gonna be substantial increases that um, are going to affect our available funding that we have um, for uh, any augmentations or anything that we wanna do on the expenditure side. So. Questions. Uh, yeah, nothing like a great budget report to keep us excited at this hour. I've got a second wind. I don't know about you guys, but let's I'm just sorry. keep going. <laughs> uh, all right, any other questions, members of the board? Uh, and so people wonder why this got scheduled. I wasn't trying to be mean, but we're required by law to get this approved and forwarded to the state. So that's why it did find itself on this agenda in conflict. <laughs> with another very long item. So my apologies, but. That was my question. That's, that's and, why. and the only question. That was, that was why. I wasn't trying to be mean-spirited, but this is required, I believe, by September 15th is the date it's to be sent. And that's the next budget item we'll be dealing with. So if Just no to be clear, we need to, if we're gonna go past 12 o'clock, we will need a new board meeting, so. Well, we have 30 minutes, so uh, if there's no other questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve this item, which is the 2014-15 adopted budget. And by the way, in your PowerPoint, only because I, uh, the question came up about our retreat, and I saw that in there, one of the areas we are also talking about at our retreat is our board goals. So uh, thank you for reminding me on that one as well. There is a motion and a second already on the floor. If there's no other questions, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll on item 12.5. President Kellogg? Aye. Vice President Otto? Aye. Member Baxter? Aye. Member Zia? Aye. Thank you. That motion carries without objection. We're now to 12.6, and this is simply the budget. This is required. This is the form that goes to the, the state of California and the chancellor's office. So if they uh, entertain a motion to approve uh, forwarding this application or this form to the appropriate uh, so agencies. Moved. Motion by Trustee second. Otto, second by Trustee Baxter. Questions, members of the board? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on item 12.6. President Kellogg? Aye. Vice President Otto? Aye. Member Baxter? Aye. Member Zia? Aye. Motion carries without objection. 12.7 is a general obligation refunding bond sale 2014 Series E. This is an informational item only, which means there's no vote. So what information is being presented to the board at this time? President Oakley. I'll turn over to Vice President Gable. Right, so we just recently uh, finalized the uh, refinancing of some of our bonds. Um, so this was... Uh, what the board had approved on um, via resolution on June 24, 2014, we refinanced $43.2 million of some of our bonds. Um, it closed on August 28th, and so you'll see there on the second page uh, within your board docket that um, ultimate, the reason that we refinanced was so that we could save our taxpayers uh, money on the obligation to repay the general obligation bonds. And so the total savings to this taxpayers uh, was the $3,149,000. The present value of that is uh, $2,268,000 for um, an overall 5.2% savings uh, for the taxpayers. And again, remember, our uh, general obligation bonds are assessed to our local property homeowners, um, it comes through on their property taxes. And so when we refinance, we are lowering the amount of interest that we're paying on the bonds, meaning that we won't have to charge the homeowners as much to repay that debt. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. This was an informational item only, no action required by the board. So we will move on, unless there's any questions. Any yeah, questions, help? sorry. As trustee Z. Um, just uh, for my understanding, how would the tax savings be um, realized? Are, are folks gonna get a, a break on their uh, homeowner's tax uh, 
uh, stubs or how, how is that going to how is it yes. going to manifest? Yeah, so um, each year annually the um, county will determine what the rates are going to be and so ultimately this will decrease the amount is char that is charged to the individual homeowners for this particular series of bonds. And does it um, state what the reason is and it's due to no, it just has a dollar amount that's assessed on the property taxes. So the tax ta ta taxpayers won't necessarily know that it's because we saved them money. Correct. Okay. Well, let it be known for the record that we saved them money. You brought this item. <laughs> All right. Good thing. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. All right, moving on. No action required. Uh, there is no item for Pacific Coast Campus. Correct. Uh, college Advancement and Economic Development. No items. Correct. Uh, moving on to reports and communications. Academic Senate President Kane, how are you? Doing really well. Good. Yes. I'll just be very short and, and say I'd like to um, announce and congratulate uh, three faculty members who have stepped into faculty leadership roles. Um, our new curriculum chair is Kenna Hillman. Our new faculty professional development coordinator is Jerry Florence. And our new honors coordinator is Dr. Jeff Wheeler. Very good. Uh, and also in the board retreat, we're working with you on trying to develop some things to regard with academic senate faculty. Okay. Because that's two weeks away and getting closer. Less than two weeks. In less than two weeks. Superintendent President Report. President Oakley. Yes, thank you, Board President Kellogg. I only have about a 45-minute report. Very um, good. <laughs> but uh, it's all covered in my handout for the board that um, covers all the recent activities that we wanted to highlight for the board, so I won't go into any detail at this time. I, I have a question on your report. Of course. Just kidding. <laughs> um, just we that, where's my picture? <laughs> all right. Yeah. Was that intentional or unintentional? I'm sure Absolutely. it was unintentional. That there was ev everybody's picture but mine. You were not there. You, you were not no, there. No, I wasn't even invited to those sessions, but that's okay. Next time. The, uh, uh, oh, okay. Doug isn't in there either. Yeah, how come I'm not in You weren't invited either then. <laughs> All right. It's just, but Roberto was. Yeah. Um, it was... Prior to the new board also. Doug was chastising he was, me. He was, that's the, what he was busy with. Prior to the new board being seated. Uh, thank you, President uh, Oakley. Student trustee, student trustee Root, I gave you the opportunity to speak at the very beginning and you said, no, I'm going to stay through the meeting. So congratulations. It is your I time I stuck now. my foot in my mouth. I realize that now. I, I only have one thing to say. There's been a rumor going around campus that I was going to resign my position. That rumor is not true. I'm stuck here. You're stuck with me. To quote the late, great Joan Rivers, I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me, baby. End of my report. Thank you. All right. We're happy to have you, trust me. Uh, board of Trustees, any Board of Trustees have any comments I, at this time? I have a report. Chair recognizes uh, Trustee Zia. Okay, thank you for st uh, sticking it around. And um, it's a pleasure having you on the board, Student Trustee Rude. Um, so just a, a quick update um, that uh, uh, Trustee Baxter and I will be starting a scholarship fund for students, two scholarship funds, and um, it'll be for um, students who are underserved and don't get BOG waivers. They don't get qualified for BOG waivers. So that's one, one scholarship and one for full-time ESL students. So I encourage students, <laughs> yes, you can applaud. <laughs> um, I encourage students to inquire about how to go about it. We're, I'm thrilled to have my partner in doing this, uh, Trustee Baxter, and um, we can't wait. Um, it'll be released uh, when, uh, Trustee well, Baxter? Well, it will be awarded at the uh, May scholarship reception, and then the first one will be given out next year. And I just happen to bring for you, yes. tonight only, uh, a, a criteria sheet and a payroll deduction form and envelopes for making donations just in case. So pass that right down All to right. Trustee Zia. Thank you. I um, gladly accept and can't wait to contribute my um, stipend. 10% uh, of our stipend, uh, monthly stipend, will go to these funds. and. Um, 
welcome your input, your suggestions, anything we could do better on these scholarships and beyond. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have the members of the board this time. Uh, yeah, I have, Trustee I have Baxter. A, a quick report. Um, we, uh, the Long Beach City College Foundation, is going to invite the new faculty to our October 16th board meeting. Um, the vice presidents and the student trustee and all the uh, elected trustees will also be invited. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start the meeting at 7 a.m. in case students need to leave and get uh, students, in case faculty need to leave and get to their classes before our normally starting time of 7.30. So you will all be getting invitations and um, we're just gonna say welcome to the college and glad you're here. Thank you. Other members, none? Uh, future reports, I have none to report out at this time. I will be having uh, public comments on non-agenda items. Lynn Shaw. All right. Um, there's no other, uh, no other speakers, Madam Secretary, that I have. This is the only one. All right, very good. Uh, then uh, there's no other business before the, the board at this time. We are, uh, the, we will be adjourning, and our next meeting will be this Thursday, a special meeting here in the chamber at 6 p.m. Uh, and you will be notifying the, uh, the five individuals. Very good. So... Uh, and then the retreat is going to be is scheduled, and we're again putting that agenda together as well. So, uh, if there's no objections, and I doubt there will be, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion and a second. Without objection, the meeting is adjourned. And thank you all very much. This was a very long meeting, but you all deserve a round of applause. So, good job, everyone. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Six AM?